Hello everyone and welcome to this Agile Business Webcast series broadcast, Engineering Your Release Automation, Agile Operations in Practice. This webcast is brought to you by CMC Media and is sponsored by Nolio. I'm Mitchell Funk, Editorial Assistant for Agile Journal, and I'll be your moderator today for this webcast. In a few moments, Bob Aiello and Leslie Sachs will join us to discuss Agile Operations in Practice. But first I want to go over a few housekeeping details. Our new livecast environment is intended to be completely interactive, and we've redesigned the way we'll deliver online events of all kinds. One of the first things you might notice is the new event chat window that is directly below the screen. This is where you'll submit the questions to the speaker as well as other attendees. We'll follow along during the presentation and address your questions during a Q&A session later on in the program. In addition, you also have the ability to make the chat box pop out so it doesn't get hidden behind the slides. You'll see the little pop out button there. Just click that and then it won't be uh, obstructed by anything else on your screen. You'll find a button to download a copy of today's presentation and under other files under the Downloads tab at the top right of the page. We also have speaker info and the Welcome tab, uh, some, some good information for you there. There are social media outlets located at the upper left of the video player. And uh, if you want to use Twitter and Facebook, but please do to share your thoughts on today's event, bring uh, other people into the mix. To the right of the page, you'll also notice a, a Twitter roll where uh, you can tweet about today's event and where people's tweets are continuously displayed. Uh, please remember to use the Agile LC hashtag in your tweet so people know where you're coming from and what you're talking about. See that over on the right-hand side of your screen. During the presentation today, if you ever need to get a closer look at any of the slides, just hover your mouse over the video player and press full. So you'll notice that pop-up come up. You can also pause it in at any time. And so with that, I'm going to introduce our speakers. Joining us today, we have Leslie Sachs, who will actually be joining us later on in the program during the Q&A portion with Bob Aiello. Leslie Sachs is a New York State Certified School Psychologist and a COO of Yellow Spider, Inc. Leslie is the co-author of CM Best Practices, Practical Methods That Work in the Real World uh, with Addison Wesley Professional. Ms. Sachs has over 20 years of experience in the psychology field and has worked in a variety of clinical and business settings where she has provided many effective interventions designed to improve the social and educational functioning of both individuals and groups. She may be reached at lesliasachs at gmail.com or you can link up with her on LinkedIn. LinkedIn excuse me, uh, links there for you. And uh, to introduce our presenter, we have Bob Aiello. Bob Aiello is a consultant, editor-in-chief for CM Crossroads and the author of CM Best Practices, Practical Methods That Work in the Real World. Mr. Aiello has over 25 years of experience as a technical manager in several top New York City financial services firms where he had company-wide responsibility for CM, often providing hands-on technical support for enterprise source code management tools, compliance with SOX and COBIT, build engineering, continuous integration, and automated application deployment. Um, with that, I want to thank both of them for being here today very much. We have a great show, and uh, the floor is now yours, Bob. Thank you so much, Mitch. And uh, I got to tell you, it's really fun to be on the other side of the microphone today. So we will be talking about engineering your release automation, agile operations in practice. And I want to start by considering what some of our goals are, because it's always good to really consider where we want to get to. So first and foremost, we want to make sure that we can rapidly build, package, and deploy our applications. We need a reliable and repeatable process, and we need to be able to tell exactly what we have deployed. Now, a lot of times people will say to me, ah, we can go look in uh, our source code management tool. We know what we tag, but that's not good enough. And we're going to talk about how to really know exactly what we deployed in, be absolutely certain that we know what's on in production at any time. And I'm going to ask you folks to do a paradigm shift with me and consider most organizations think of release and deployment in terms of risk. They dread having to deal with the, a release. A release is something where everybody basically loses their weekend, and we're going to talk about that. Instead, at the end of this broadcast, I hope you're going to be looking at automated deployment as your greatest asset and a fantastic way to improve your abilities as a developer and as a technology professional. 
But there's some problems we're going to have to address. And these are problems that I run into in my consulting practice. They're things that keep me up late at night sometimes. Basically, deployments can be a risky business. I've been in lots of environments where uh, the deploys often were followed by serious problems that impacted the production systems, possibly uh, resulting in a bad trade or some other event that really could create problems. Another problem is that if you miss a single step in the release process, that can result in a serious outage. The common problem is that there's just too many mistakes. People often find when they do a release that despite their best efforts, it's very easy to make mistakes, partially because there's so many manual steps. Many release processes really require a lot of uh, single manual steps that are very easy to make a mistake and overall the release process just takes too long. And one of the things that I really highlight when I'm talking to people is it's important to be able to back out. If you promote something forward, if you up grade your production systems, you need to make sure you have some way to pull things back if as soon as you come live, you find that there's a problem with your environment. So being able to back out is just as important as being able to go forward. And the most important problem that I find is this key person risk. Now here's my friend George. He's the only one who knows how to do a release. And George is a hardworking guy. He's a great guy. But we want to make sure that more than one person knows how to do a production release at any time. And by the way, a release to QA is just as important as a release to production. We, we're going to be talking about how to improve the way that you do automated release management, whether it be to development, QA, or production. But we don't want to have this key person risk where only one person knows how to promote the release. Some other issues. I often find the teams tell me, you know, we were doing great. We had only seven developers. We were a small shop, and we were unbelievably successful. And then we started adding a couple more people, and now it doesn't seem like we can get anything right. And the basic issue a lot of organizations find is there's so much cognitive complexity. It's just so difficult to get your arms around the whole system. And then there's scalability. We've had a fabulous system go into production. We're, we're doing really well with it. We're making a lot of money. Now we have to scale up. We have to be able to use more servers. And that scalability is just not there. And I think one of the most important issues is overcoming a mindset. And that's one of the reasons why I've asked my co-author, Leslie Sachs, to join me today. Because there's a psychology to release management. Too often, people just get used to failing. And we're going to deal with that today. Uh, the, the thing that often just absolutely upsets me is when people just decide we're going to blow another weekend. We're going to start Friday night. We're going to spend the whole week tr weekend trying to do this release. And we've just given up all hope of it going well. We, we, know, we know we're going to have a bad weekend. That defeatist mindset is a thing of the past. We're going to talk about exactly how to deal with being able to use the release process as your greatest asset. So uh, one of the things that's happened to me quite a bit, I jokingly call this release interruptus. I was in the middle of a release to production. My buddies running the project management office comes over to get an update on my project plan. And he says to me, Bob, I really need to know your status on these items. And my head's deep in doing a release to production. And, it's the only thing I can think of. And he really insists on me stopping for five minutes and giving him the dates uh, that my deliverables are going to be due. And then I look back at my checklist, and I don't even remember where I was. This is something that is absolutely a disaster. If you have a release process that is so complicated that if somebody interrupts you, it's difficult to tell where you are and be able to resume without accidentally missing a step or doing a step twice is sometimes just as bad. So I once had a bet with a CTO. This chief technology officer brought me into a small trading firm that was having problems with their release management. He told me that they typically released on Friday nights once or twice a month and they were almost always down in production on Monday when the users wanted to be able to work with the new system. 
the CTO made a one-way bet with me. He brought me in as the release manager and he said, Bob, I'm going to give you about three releases, maybe about two weeks. And either I'm going to give you a big fat bonus at the end of the year for fixing this problem, or I'm going to let you go and you can go find a job somewhere else. It was just that simple. It was a one-way bet and my job was on the line. And I'm pleased to tell you that I was able to fix their release process in three releases and come up with a way for them never to have these kind of problems. And I'm going to talk about exactly how I did that today. So whenever we start this type of journey, you always want to assess where you're at. You want to take a look at what your current practices are. And you want to do an honest assessment of how you're doing configuration management, source code management. And the assessment is really important. Some of the sorts of things I find is that there's often too many manual steps. If there is any automation, a lot of times it's just too unreliable. Uh, it breaks down. Um, people often forget to actually test the automation itself, which is kind of funny. Uh, writing scripts to automate a process is just another system, and you have to QA and test the scripts themselves, just like you have to with any other piece of software. And I often find that in a lot of places, nobody really understands how to do the build. And one reason that I often find that there's a problem is that there's just too many moving parts. So these are the common things that I find when I enter an organization and I start off by doing an assessment. Your list may be a little bit different, but you always want to start by assessing exactly what the current practices are. Let me tell you one, one tip. In every organization I've ever been in, there was one thing that they did really well. So don't start off by changing things. Start off by assessing what they're doing, taking an honest look at it, and then creating a plan to move forward. The most common thing that I find in doing these assessments is cognitive complexity. I find that the team doesn't have the ability to really get their arms around the whole build process. There's too many moving parts. There's too many specialists. One guy may understand everything there is to know about WebSphere. Another guy may understand the database cold. But bringing everybody together can often be very challenging. And then we have different platforms. The developers are typically working on Windows. We might deploy to Linux. We might use some virtual machines, some VMs for QA. And then we might deploy in a, a service-oriented environment. And this is all part of the cognitive complexity that we have to address in the release management process. So the real question is, how can we automate something if we don't really understand it? And I, I want to tell you that part of what we're going to talk about, and I think part of what having a good framework for doing release management helps you tame, is this cognitive complexity. And I'm going to give you some specific information on how to do that today. So my own three steps. This is the typical process that I go through whenever I join a new organization and I have to take a look at the way they're doing the release management. The first time I watch and I take some notes, but I just try to take it all in. I watch them doing the release. The second time I try to work off of a checklist that I've written up from my notes and I do the driving. This way I can make sure that I don't miss a step. By the third time I want to have scripts in place that I'm using to drive the automation. Now a lot of times I can't do this all at once and it may be a series of different scripts and a combination of a checklist and scripts but you want to be working toward automating the whole release process from the build to the deploy everything has to be automated and the automation has to provide you with good logging and good traceability. So it does take a bit more effort to get the whole stream automated. And one of the things that I find is important is to start with a piece of it, get that working, and then uh, iteratively grow your automated process from there. And this is a typical three-step process that I go through when I'm approaching these type of tasks. But I think one of the things that we really need 
uh, to have. And uh, it's one of the reasons I'm really grateful to Nolio, nice folks at Nolio, for sponsoring this uh, uh, webinar, is we really need a framework. We need a way to understand how to build, package, and deploy. We need a way to iteratively ascertain and tame the whole process. So what I'm talking about is you need a backbone that you can attach these scripts to, to attach your automation and provide a framework so that you can start with the beginning and you work your way through the whole automation process. And most importantly, you need a feedback loop. Did each step work? I mean, it's not just a matter of building, but you want to make sure did that build correctly? Did the application deploy to the right environment? Is it working the right way? So you need a feedback loop. This framework is going to be largely what we describe throughout the rest of this webcast. So I got to tell you, a lot of times uh, developers look at me and say, ah, we don't need no stinking automation. Why? Real developers don't need to automate anything. They, they, they're so smart they can do all the steps on the fly by typing fast. I've really had developers argue with me over this that we don't need to automate the release process. And, you know, a lot of people feel that we just need smart developers. And another thing that I often run into is people will say it's too complicated to automate. And this, this whole thing just can't be done. So I, I hope I'm sort of giving you a flavor for the sorts of things you're going to run into as people just sort of resist uh, this kind of change in improving the environment. So do we need automation? You bet we do. And in fact, it's essential. If you don't automate, you're not going to be able to have a repeatable process and traceable process. So automation is fundamental. So I want to go out to a couple of my colleagues. Jez Humble and David Farley wrote a fantastic book called uh, Continuous Delivery. Uh, and Dean Leffingwell uh, describes uh, the Agile release team in his book. Uh, really, really two excellent uh, resources that uh, uh, I, I've certainly learned a lot from. I want to I want to quote them in a couple of places now. Uh, but first, I found this statement from Mary and Tom Poppendiek to be shocking. They asked the question, "How long would it take your organization?" to deploy a change that involves just one single line of code. And in many organizations, deploying one line of code is just as difficult as deploying a complete release. And in fact, for one line of code, they could actually take down production. So I think Mary and Tom are right on here. We need to look at our whole build package, release, and deployment processes and take a very hard look at what's involved with them and how we, got, we must improve them. So my own lessons learned, uh, before we get into learning a bit from uh, Jez and, and uh, Dean, I want to talk about some of the things that I've always found to be really effective. First and foremost, I look at release management the way engineers look at the cockpit of a plane. If you ever look at the cockpit of a plane, the controls are set up to make it almost impossible for the pilot to make a mistake. Obviously, we could never tolerate pilot error because he misread some type of dial on the screen. It's absolutely unacceptable. And I'm sure if you're if you're a frequent flyer like I am, as I'm traveling to clients all the time, you certainly want that pilot to be able to read those controls and not make a mistake. But we we need to do the same thing in release management. We have to consider the ergonomics of software development. We have to automate everything and make sure we do it in such a way that it's impossible to make a mistake. That is one of the most important things to consider in the whole release management process. You also want to make sure that everything is repeatable, that it's tra traceable, and as Deming said so long ago, you want to build quality in. You know, when I was going to school back in uh, the 80s and the early 90s, uh, I found myself very much drawn to the quality management literature, uh, particularly as it developed. And I think a lot of Agile now is really 
doing a great job of bringing out Deming's teachings. And one of the most important things is building quality in. When we automate the release process, we want to make sure that we do it in such a way that quality is absolutely implicit in every step of the process. So that includes verification and validation. So verification and validation, of course, is are we testing, uh, do we pass our tests, and are we testing the right thing? Now, separate from that, and equally important, is are we testing the application and helping the QA team? So there's two different things here, and I want to make sure that I'm clear about describing this. When you write scripts, you have to make sure that your scripts do the right thing and that they work correctly. But you also want to facilitate in those scripts testing the application itself. So we're going to talk about what some of those tests should be as well. So these are some of my own lessons learned. I really want to highlight the ergonomics of software development. Make sure when you do this that you make it almost impossible for the release manager to make an error. Because frankly at 2 o'clock in the morning when you got to go through a disaster recovery fire drill, that's not a time to try to be clever. You know, I, I've had this many times, a system crashed or a bad disk and I need to quickly be able to recover the whole environment. At 2 o'clock in the morning you want things to be easy. You want to design your automation so that it's really uh, compelling. So one of the things that Dean Leffingwell talks about in his book on Agile Software Requirements is the Agile Release Train. So Dean discusses making each product a successful and routine event, an event that is indeed planned and eagerly anticipated, yet one that happens almost on autopilot. And that is where we got to be. We have to be at a place where release management is so clearly laid out that it runs on autopilot. And I don't think it's an accident that Dean picked an autopilot. That goes right back to the analogy that I always say, you want to consider the ergonomics the same way you consider the cockpit of a plane. So Jez Humble and Dave Farley, in their book on continuous delivery, they talk about the deployment pipeline. A pipeline is an automated implementation of your application's build, deploy, test and release process. And these two gentlemen do also do a great job of really drawing out the importance of automating the whole release management process. And like I said before, it doesn't happen in a day. You may have to build it in pieces. It is an agile, iterative development effort, just like software development is in creating your applications. Now the aim of the pipeline, you want to make it building, deploying, testing, and releasing software visible to everyone involved. It should be clear what's going on. A lot of times it's a black box. There's no reason for that. If you set up a continuous integration server and it's got a console, everybody can see the state of the build. They can see which builds are most important and tagged. It improves feedback so the problems are identified. If we check in some code and breaks the build, we can resol resolve those problems early in the process. Mistakes happen, but it's very easy to be able to identify those mistakes early and resolve them. I always tell people, you know what, when I write my scripts to do release automation, I might make a mistake. I'm a human being, I can make mistakes, but I'll always be able to show you what I did, and I'll always be able to show you exactly what the steps were so that there's traceability and visibility. And the aim of the pipeline is also enables team, teams to deploy and release any version of their software to any environment at will through a fully automated process. That is critical. If you get a report from a customer who says, you know what, we had a bug, you want to be able to rack up that exact version of the code in a particular test environment and look at that bug and deal with that process, that particular problem, that is a huge advantage and will help your team be so much more effective. Now they also talk a little bit about anti-patterns. These are things you don't want to do. So uh, uh, you don't want to deploy your software manually. It, it, we've talked about it, it's just silly. Deploying to production-like environment only after the development is complete. Now what that means is, you know, you don't want to 
do a deployment to production and that's the first time you've run that software in production now look realistically I've worked in places where they could not duplicate the production environment and that creates a risk and sometimes life's not perfect but you want to try to get as good an environment as you can and one of the things I'm seeing a lot of organizations doing is using virtualization to for a temporary period of time create a production like environment to test the deploy and to do some uh, uh, regression testing and then I mean that's a lot of resources so they just they do it for a couple of days and then they drop it so deploying to production like environment that should be something that occurs not just when you're actually going to production it should be done beforehand to see how that code is going to uh, uh, operate in that environment the other thing you don't want to do, this is another anti-pattern, you certainly don't want to have yourself doing manual configuration of the production environments. Look, when everything is nice and calm, you can do that. But when there's a lot of stress in the environment, uh, when it's 2 o'clock in the morning, when your boss is over your shoulder, it's too easy to make a mistake. You want to make sure that your configuration of the production environments is automated and traceable and that you can test and make sure that you've got the right configuration in there. Now there's some considerations for Agile CM. Agile CM is taking the industry by storm. You want to be able to rapidly build, package, and deploy you want to be able to support iterative development. You want to be able to make iterative development easy. You want to be able to deliver functionality to the end user. So if the end user wants to see a certain feature, I want to be able to cook up a beta copy of the software and show it to them. You know, I've worked in places where, you know, the end user controlled a million dollar account. You want to make sure they see their functionality and they're happy with it. So being able to deliver that functionality to the end user and, and get their buy-in, get make them part of the agile development process is really, really essential. And most of all, you want to maximize continuous integration with deployment to a test environment. It's not just enough to build. Martin Fowler makes this very clear in his, uh, in his work. You want to make sure that you're deploying the whole application to a test environment and actually shaking it out as part of continuous integration. Now, one of the best practices I found is staging. And I, I'm sort of surprised at how many organizations have never heard of staging. I never just deploy my code straight to production. I always queue up the code in a test area, in a staging area, in a separate directory. I, I move the code onto the servers. I have it standing by and fully configured and it should be like a light switch when you're ready to automate that deploy when you're ready to cause that automation to fire you bring down the production system you switch it over you bring it up you do some production testing during whatever window you have and if necessary you fall back to the previous release being able to fall back is just as important as being able to seamlessly go forward so staging is one of the best practices. I actually make staging an elaborate um, loving event where I really focus on making sure that I get all the code out there and do all the work up front. So the actual production deploy is just as simple as throwing a light switch. And you either go forward or if necessary you pull back. Now one thing you got to be able to do is call a configuration audit. Um, some Sometimes I'm kind of amazed at how many people don't know what this is. In all the standards and frameworks, it talks about being able to test your environment and make sure that physically you've got the right binaries there, you've got the right config files, and that functionally the binaries are operating as they should. So there's a physical and there's a functional configuration audit. If you look in uh, the IEEE 828, uh, it's one of the standards working groups that I work with very closely. Uh, if you look at any of the standards working groups, configuration audit is one of the four basic CM functions uh, that is always required for any compliance. Uh, so that is, it's easy to do. You just build some scripts to test your environment and you can automate that as part of the deployment framework. So, Ah, this is another slide on the physical configuration audit of the binary. And most of all, you want to trust 
but verify. So yeah, I know I push the code out there, but sometimes you'll find that through some event, the code that's out there is not what you thought was out there. So sometimes people will say to me, hey, we know the version that's in Subversion. We know the version that's in ClearCase. We have it tagged. We have it labeled. The labels are locked. We're sure that every we know the version. But that doesn't tell you what version is running in production. And you need to be able to trust but verify that you know the exact version of the code that's running in production. So I got to tell you about a story that happened to me, and this is a true story. It's something I've written about in my book on uh, CM best practices, and my my website is uh, down there on the bottom, cmbestpractices.com. One day I was called into a room, and they told me that I had personally made a mistake that had stopped the entire world economy. And uh, the the mistake was it was uh, two shell scripts that were running. Uh, were the wrong versions of the shell scripts and, and these were running uh, in an application that was being used by the specialist on the floor of a stock exchange. Now the job of a specialist in a stock exchange is to maintain an orderly market. So if his computer system goes down, uh, obviously he can't maintain an orderly market and that entire exchange crashed uh, and, and I uh, I didn't actually see this, but someone told me that somebody had to actually testify before Congress as to uh, what had occurred. So uh, it was a, it was an upsetting event, and uh, I thought to myself, how could I have made such a silly mistake? So I went to the production area with one of the Unix SAs, and I conducted a configuration audit. And basically, we generated a release map that showed me exactly... Uh, what was there in production and I compared that to the map that shipped with the release and I was able to tell them that two shell scripts could not have come from me because they didn't have my stamp in it and the only way they could get on the tape is if they had my stamp on it. So I looked at the Unix SA and I said hey I'm sure those two shell scripts didn't come from me and we we searched a little further and we found that there was a bug in one of the uh, uh, scripts that the SAs had and they were accidentally overwriting my two shell scripts. So the release deployed correctly but then they were overwritten and the bug was still there and it was live. And the, the, the end of the story is that we were able to ascertain very quickly what the problem was, we were able to fix it, and management was actually very impressed with our abilities to address this kind of problem. And most importantly, we all got our bonuses, which I guess is uh, one of the most important things there. So that was that was an exciting event, but it all turned out the way that it should. And, and uh, you know, what we're talking about is having this power and the ability to really have control over your environments. So that's got to start with assessing your risk. You want to be able to know exactly what kind of problems uh, could impact you. Now, typically there are unknowns um, and other risk complexity can't always be tamed, and that's true. So you have to mitigate that risk by automating what you can and also having a plan B. And, uh, you know, obviously the reality is sometimes you can't automate everything, but the truth is you can automate a lot more than you think. And what I'm trying to get across here is that it's important to automate everything. And for those things that truly cannot be automated, you need to consider what that risk is, have a plan B, and release planning is just essential. Now, the fact that you can't eliminate every single risk doesn't mean that you shouldn't eliminate 98 or 99.9%. .9 that will make all the difference in the world. So risk assessment is key, but at the end of the day, you've got to aggressively work towards automating your entire build package and deployment process. So one of the things that you should consider is having what's called a change control board. So the change control board reviews the plans for uh, doing your uh, deployment and Idle has done a great job of uh, describing the change advisory board or what's called the cab and it's a little like playing the game who wants to be a millionaire and the, you see my buddy on the picture there he's calling out to his lifeline saying hey if we close 
port 23, what's the downstream impact of that? And, and, and here's what I'm talking about. Typically in a change advisory board, the people involved with change management are not necessarily the experts on how the application works. Usually they're people that are involved with the process, they're involved with the release management. Uh, you may have a QA representative there, certainly operations representative, but you don't have every single developer and technology expert that's out there. What you should be doing is assigning a subject matter expert to each of your assets. And Idle again talks about SACM, which we can have another webinar at a different time to talk about how to use Idle. But the key thing is you find the person who's an expert on that piece of the system and you give them a call and you find out what the downstream impact is. That is the essence of having a change advisory board and that's a key practice within your uh, release management process and make sure that your automated stream has identified all of those issues so having a change control board using it in the right way well you may very well be a millionaire in terms of uh, your abilities with release management so Jess Humble also says I just love this line I feel like he's been looking over over my shoulder if it hurts do it more frequently and bring the pain forward this is so right. If you're having trouble with your release management, do it more often. I've been in a lot of environments where release management was a Friday night thing. They just gave up their weekend. They just accepted it was never going to work right. And one of the things I did is I made it a Tuesday, Thursday thing. And I got them to do more frequent releases, but each one was smaller. So by doing the releases more frequently and doing the releases smaller, we got better at release management and we never had problems from that point forward. So smaller iterative releases, why are they better? Well, they're much less risk. You get better at it. You make releasing a non-event. And if something does go wrong, just like in continuous integration, if you're building the application with every commit of the code or every check-in, you know right away what broke the build. Well, in the same way, if you do smaller iterative releases, you'll know right away what went wrong, and that can help you out a great deal. So doing smaller iterative releases will make your release management a lot more reliable. So we've talked about this. You want to make sure you automate uh, your processes, why? Because they're easier to test. You have traceability. Like I said, I might make a mistake, but you'll always be able to see exactly what I did at any point in time because my release management automation always logs everything. It always tests everything. And you'll be able to tell if I made a mistake. And, and for that matter, what did I do last month? So continuous integration, of course, is a key practice. You want to be able to build, package, and deploy to a test region. You want to be able to provide a service to the developers. You know, automated deployment is not just about pushing stuff out to production or QA for that matter. It's also helping out the developers. And one of the messages that I want to get across is we need to support our developers. They've got a tough job. If we can f develop a process to quickly build a package and deploy, throw it into a test region uh, on an iterative basis, that is going to provide a huge service to the developers. It's going to help their productivity. It's going to help the quality of the application. And one of the one of the signs that you've been successful is if your continuous integration server console goes down and the developers start complaining, well, that kind of tells you that they were really starting to find this to be very helpful. So. Deming says build quality in. I want to emphasize the fact it's important to test the release automation itself. The shoemaker's children, this is the shoemaker right here. You see he's making a pair of shoes. I happen to know for a fact that's for his own kids. So we want the shoemaker's children to actually have some uh, shoes themselves. So for testing in QA, deployment needs to include testing. You want to do smoke testing. That's the last step in the deploy. Any release manager should know how to, to test the application. You want to facilitate regression, functional, and performance testing. You want to instrument the code. Well, all of this automation should include a heavy focus on helping the test team and the QA team be able to verify the application uh, is working correctly. 
So you got to test your own automation and you got to test the application. So platforms and deployment, we want to consider you got to build once and deploy everywhere. I've worked in places where they built the application separately for each environment. That is just not not acceptable. That's a compliance issue. It's definitely not the way you want to work. You want to make sure you build it once, configure it, and deploy it. You want to automate and control the configuration for each environment. And you want to be able to do verification and validation for the environment as well. And don't forget that you're going to have to run this on virtual machines and also very often run it as a service. So a lot of situations I find that we're developing, de developers are working on Windows boxes, but they deploy on Linux. It's a very common use case. So considering that you have to be able to create a automated deployment process that works on Windows, it works on Linux, Unix, works on virtual machines, it works when you're running, scaling up for uh, software uh, as a service, all of these things have to be considered uh, as part of your deployment automation. Now you also have to look at your environment. You want to make sure that you can go out and verify the version of Java, the OS patches, uh, which ports are open, are you pointing to the right database. So don't forget your environment configuration. That's really critical. You can do that as part of these streams that I'm talking about. And you have to consider complex technologies. So, Look, Tomcat and Apache are okay, but you know, I've worked a lot with WebSphere, uh, WebSphere, WebLogic, JBoss. Sometimes those configurations, particularly when you start clustering those application servers, that can get uh, you know kind of complicated. Uh, database dependencies, working with data warehousing, and the fantastic OSGI. And, and I'll tell you, we have an upcoming webcast on Apache Mix. Uh, you can contact me, and I'll give you the date for that. Uh, these are all really important things to consider and sometimes you got to work and take this as a specialty task to deal with some of this complexity. But you have to consider some of these complex technologies when you're automating the whole stream. So I was talking about my agent is going to handle that. I'm not talking about the agent for my book, uh, but I'm talking about the agent uh, who helps me handle deployment on a particular machine. So. You want to have a situation where you're causing a deploy to occur, but there should be some software running on that target machine that handles the actual configuration in that environment. So I can trigger a release to a PC, I can trigger a release to a Unix box, to an AIX box, and on that box is an agent that's going to run and do all the work that has to be done to install that software and configure it. And this is how you get your scalability and the ability to do parallel deploys. I've worked in environments where we set this up, we could trigger deploys to 100 machines, and each machine is doing separate work. They can all in parallel do their deployment, as opposed to trying to go out to each machine uh, one at a time, which of course is not possible. And you need to be able to start and stop these uh, releases on each of the machines. You need to be able to ascertain the status. So. When you're dealing with the scalability issues, if you deploy to 100 machines, you've got to make sure that you can go out and look and see, hey, five of those machines, uh, for whatever reason, uh, did not complete. We can go and examine what the problem is. Uh, it, it could be a, a hardware failure. It could be for some reason they weren't in a ready state. But your deployment has to not just uh, cause the deployment to occur to those machines, you have to be able to ascertain the status and start and stop the deployment on each of those machines. So uh, this is a tall order, but it's really important to have this capability. You also want to have a separation of controls. So in many compliance environments, you really need to be able to separately and individually build, package, and deploy. Uh, a lot of times companies don't have money to have a separate build manager, I've actually had great success by automating this using a separate computer account and a lot of times the audit department is fine with sort of having a virtual release manager. And this helps you with your compliance requirements with IT governance and don't forget that configuration audit. You gotta know exactly what is running in production. So with agile development you always want to be able to iteratively do this type of work, constantly improve and the most important thing is begin the journey. 
So what are some of the best practices? We're wrap on, wrapping up right now. We want to provide a framework for knowledge management around the build, release, and deploy. This is not easy stuff to get under uh, lock and key, so you got to have something that helps you uh, be able to really get all this information in one place. you got to iteratively improve the process. So you start with some of the scripts, plug that into your framework, and be able to grow that and build upon it. And uh, you also want to provide a service to the developers. This is not just about operations. It's also about helping the developers. So, you know, in conclusion, we want to make sure that we're automating the entire deployment pipeline. It's doable. You can do this. I talked a little bit about risks. The truth is I've had great success with automating the entire pipeline. There are plenty of tools that exist that provide a comprehensive framework to do this. Our sponsor, Nolio, is one of the tools that does a fantastic job of giving you this uh, comprehensive framework. And I'm glad to talk with folks and you know even arrange a demo of the product and show you how this works. What basically this is what you have to do, and you have to be able to pick a tool set that will help you get there. And it's an iterative process. So, you know, you want to get started, but it, it's, it's not something that's going to happen uh, overnight. Now, I, I know that we've got some great questions out there. I'm going to ask my partner, Leslie Sachs, who is uh, my co-author, to come on. And uh, I don't know if, Mitch, we got you there, too. Uh, I want to take some of the questions, and I want to make sure everybody understands that if we don't get to your question, I'm always online on CM Crossroads. Uh, we're glad to take your questions afterwards. I see we got some folks uh, uh, chatting it up, but uh, uh, please rest assured if we don't get to your question today, we will get to you. So we got a first question there. So um, let's see. Mitch, do you have my questions or uh, Leslie? Yep, Bob, this is Mitch. Uh, I want to first thank you for the presentation. I know we all got a lot of great information out of it. I think Leslie's going to handle the question part here. And um, Leslie, thank you very much for joining us. I'll pass it off to you. OK, so Bob, first question we have is, how would you pick where to get started with a particular automate, automation process? This is a great question. It's one that comes up uh, all the time. And I got to tell you, I pick a low, a piece of low-hanging fruit. I pick something that's easy. I find that if I pick something to get us started, I get that done. It builds momentum. So I don't start with the toughest piece of it. I automate a couple of the easy pieces, and then I grow from there. Rome wasn't built in a day, but I always start with taking a couple of simple pieces of it and uh, uh, it's an iterative process and I find that gets me across the fa finish line a whole lot faster. Next question. So one of our participants would like to know, uh, they find that the architecture in their situation is constantly changing. How do you automate something that won't stand still? <laughs> Boy, this person's been the same companies that I'm in. Uh, I'm going to ask the question differently. How do you handle not automating it if because at least I know where I'm at when I have automation so in an environment where the architecture is constantly changing you need to put your automation under configuration control and have different releases of the automation itself so basically what I'm saying is the framework for doing release management is a software system that you need to handle in an agile development way the same way you handle your code. And I'm going to come back and say, with the environment changing so much, you needed a whole lot more because that is even more difficult to get right each and every time. Leslie? OK, that was a great explanation. Now, uh, another uh, participant was curious, how, in your experience, can you scale these types of practices to larger environments. Are they scalable? And if so, how do you go about doing that? So uh, that is a real challenge in many organizations. And it's, uh, it's something that uh, uh, comes up quite a bit. And you need to have a tools framework so that you can create the 
automated build package and deploy for a single machine and then be able to scale that. So that's part of what we talked about having different agents and having the ability uh, to do different deploys in parallel. So uh, that's exactly why you need this type of a deployment framework so that you can scale and be able to handle the deployment to many machines at once. Next. How would you um, describe to the listeners where DevOps fits into these agile efforts? <laughs> So DevOps, uh, we just, uh, the CM Journal just did a real focus on DevOps. DevOps has uh, really been a breath of fresh air in all of these efforts. Um, DevOps has put the focus on improving the way that we communicate from the beginning of the process all the way through. And of course, the whole idea of having agile, uh, self-organizing and self-managing teams is all part and parcel of this. So DevOps has really put that f right focus of having development uh, consider the work that needs to be done all the way through the life cycle to operations. And, and I, wanna, I wanna sort of frame this a little differently. Years ago, the operations guys and the developers really had nothing to do with each other. Uh, the developers did their code, it ran in QA, and then it got thrown over the over the net to, uh, it's like a game of volleyball, got thrown over the net to the uh, DevOps guys who then had to try to figure out how to run this thing. And of course, they often didn't have the knowledge that they needed, and they didn't have the tools, and it was very, very difficult to do. Well, DevOps has put the right focus on having a good communication, a good process for handling uh, that whole stream. So um, the only caveat that I'll, I'll throw in there is a couple of people thought uh, in my discussions with them that that means developers promote their code into production. And that's often uh, a compliance issue. So once again, if you've automated it and you have it being done in the separate accounts, fully traceable, that can help you really implement DevOps uh, in the right spirit and still be able to pass your audit. Now you have to always make sure you're talking with your uh, audit professionals because different organizations have to comply uh, with different requirements. Uh, but I have seen in many uh, Sarbanes-Oxley environments that this automation really makes all the difference in the world. Leslie, back to you. So one person writes in with a very interesting question which I'm sure in your practice you've come across in more than one uh, corporation that you've been helping. How do you implement automation in a project which isn't starting right now? Um, for example, it's, it's easy, you're describing how to build it right from the beginning, but what do you do if you inherit an automation system that's been in use for a while? Well, I got to tell you, uh, usually people call me in after a really bad disaster. And um, on, on the plus side, they're willing to consider changing changing and uh, you know one of the questions we often get and you might have in your deck there is uh, how do you overcome resistance to change so one of the questions one of the things I find is in a situation like that people are open to changing because they've had a disaster uh, on the other hand it is more challenging it's that cognitive complexity so I kind of want to flip it around and say how on earth would you deal with a situation like that unless you have a way uh, to really um, manage all of the complexities of that system that's running. So you gotta, you gotta break it down. It's still an iterative process, but uh, I, I live this on a day-to-day -day basis. It can be very complicated to go into a team that has an existing system that's breaking and be able to get your arms around all the factors that are necessary to create that release automation. I, I just gotta summarize by saying, how would you do it without a framework? It would be impossible. Leslie? So let's say uh, that a particular team wants to do Agile, but the management is pushing for them to continue following their corporate waterfall life cycle, which they've been employing for a while. What would you recommend in that situation? How do you reconcile these different approaches? So this is a very, very common thing. I, I work in a lot of organizations where the folks uh, uh, providing the funding really want to have a, uh, a waterfall life cycle. They want control. They want to know what's going to be delivered at each phase. 
but the individual developers they want to have their scrums their information radiators they they want to have their stand up meetings um, their you know they really want to implement agile practices because they work and what I find a lot of organizations doing is that within the context of a corporate waterfall, individual teams are doing uh, agile iterative development. And the ability to be able to continuously build the code, uh, deploy it quickly to a test machine, use the same procedures to deploy to QA, and then deploy to production. As far as I'm concerned, I'd like to see the deployment to QA be the same as the deployment to production those are really really helpful in helping the team be able to do agile practices and at the same time be able to meet the re corporate governance requirements that are often implicit in a waterfall life cycle. Leslie? So you mentioned compliance and that leads right into another question which was put forward. How do you deal with idle and other similar systems that how does that fit so, with agile efforts? So uh, it fits really very well. It's, it, it's an interesting thing. The idle framework describes how to do um, service management, ITSM. And it, it specifically does not give a lot of information on doing uh, software development. So a lot of people pointed out that agile and idle are very much complementary. There's some overlap because idle does a fabulous job of talking about how to do good configuration management, how to do change management. Uh, the CMDB have written a lot about uh, how to use uh, CMDBs in practice. So uh, idle gives you a lot of uh, good advice on that. Uh, but agile is providing you the information you need to do the software development that you're not going to find in the idle framework. So I see them as being very much complementary. So Leslie, I think we got just time for just one more uh, question and then uh, we're going to do a little bit of a wrap up. Okay, well this is something that uh, I've been curious about and I'm sure many of the listeners have to deal with this on a daily basis. Where does this all fit in with the current trend of offshore work and offshore development participants? So with offshore and uh, nearshore and having different people in different buildings in different countries, different time zones, you got to be able to coordinate the development effort when it's distributed in many different places. You may have uh, developers working uh, round the clock in, in different places. So having the ability to uh, continuously build, package, and deploy and be able to see where everything came from um, this type of a framework is really critical to be able to help uh, with those uh, you know distributed environments um, now a, a lot of what we've been talking about today is you know the details of how to do this type of automated release and deployment and I want to make sure that we uh, you know circle back and look also at uh, uh, our sponsor is Nolio they provide a fantastic uh, framework to be able to uh, tame your automated release and deployment and uh, if anyone wants a, a demo of that uh, the uh, we, we'd be glad to uh, set that up uh, but it's very important to start somewhere and have a sane way to be able to manage uh, iteratively going through and creating this release automation and uh, you know Leslie I know you've been uh, you were very much instrumental in helping me uh, write the book uh, configuration management best practices and uh, uh, you know do you have any last thoughts you want to want to share before we uh, wrap this up well, I just noticed that as you answered many of the questions, you almost had to turn it around and look at it the other way. And it seems to me from listening to your answers and your responses that really an agile approach instead of asking why or how you apply it is really the answer to how you make the system work better. And, that, and that's absolutely true. In fact, uh, the very fact that we have this challenge and we need to have a framework to resolve it. And the very fact that we've got to look at some tools and figure out how to automate the build, package, and deployment 
uh, that's really our greatest opportunity and that's that's really what I wanted to talk about today is how do you take something that's a problem and uh, of course you know uh, uh, my colleagues uh, uh, Jez Hummel and Dean Levingwell and, and uh, Mr. Farley uh, they've done a great job of talking about this as well it's really important to look at these uh, as being our greatest opportunity and the benefit and the value that can come from automating the whole build, package, and deploy, and it's going to take you some time. It's an iterative process, so you're not going to get it done overnight. Uh, the important thing is that you break it into pieces, have a framework to get your arms around all of the complexity, and be able to tame that savage beast. And then there's a lot of value and benefit that you're going to see from that. Uh, so I do want to invite everybody to uh, uh, contact me directly, or uh, I think we're going to put uh, um, Daniel Kushner's uh, email out on the chat. Uh, you can contact him directly, or you can send me an email. Uh, my LinkedIn is over there. I hope you'll all uh, come and uh, link with me on LinkedIn, and uh, uh, if you'd like a demo, we'd be glad to set you up with it. Um, but this is a journey that everybody needs to take, and it's it's important to pick the right tools to help you do the journey and I think uh, I, I can tell you that success is dramatic and it really helps you the productivity and the quality of your application and it's very much a, uh, a valuable uh, exercise to go through so Mitch you want to sign us off yes thank you Bob very much um, and Leslie I want to thank you as well for joining us and helping field the questions and provide your own input as well uh, really glad to have you here um, so everyone, thank you. Yeah, sorry. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining the webcast today. Uh, we do encourage you to explore Agile Journal for uh, related resources, such as our articles and case studies. Uh, we will hope to see you again at our next live broadcast. This was great. Hey, Mitch, uh, don't forget to invite them over to the CM Journal too. Uh, I'm on both, but uh, don't forget the stepchild there. No, nope, don't want to forget the stepchild at all. CMCrossroads.com, and you find a CM Journal there as well. Fantastic. Thanks, Leslie. Thanks, Mitch. Mitch, you want to sign us off? Yep. Uh, from all of us here, uh, thank you for joining us today, and uh, we will catch you next time.